screen about the macro prudential policy. If there is a problem, please pin me up. All good? Okay. Let's start first with the definition of the macro prudential policy. As you see here in my screen, the macro prudential policy is the ultimate objective of macro prudential policy is to preserve the financial stability. So you should always keep in mind that when we speak about the macro prudential policy, it is main and <clears throat> its main objective and ultimate target is trying to keep up the maintain the financial stability. So what how it is correlated or how it is related with price stability and let's say monetary policy after the 2008 crisis lots of central banks and market makers understand that price stability cannot be achieved without taking into consideration the financial stability so if there is a financial instability in the market if there are some financial turbulences in the market decision making process it is almost impossible to reach the price stability even you can achieve the best in your sense so the main aim from the macro prudential policy side is first to build up the stably stable financial market in the first sense so if the market financial stable, then we can add some new makeups and we can reach at the end the price stability as well. So the ultimate objective of macro prudential policy is to preserve the financial stability. This includes making the financial system more resilient and limiting the buildup of vulnerabilities in order to mitigate the system risk and ensure that financial services continue to be provided effectively to the real account. So I wanna here to talk about a little bit the 2008 global financial crisis for those who don't remember what happened at those days and how the financial vulnerabilities build up in the market, then there will be start an increase in the asset price bubble, then how the market crashed and we start a recessionary period in 2008 global financial crisis. The crisis started in the subprime mortgage market in the United States. I'm sure Dr. Walchin remembered those days well with the Lehman Brothers. And the subprime mortgage market doing this. Normally, if the Dr. Walchin or let's say Shamara Pierre come to bank and try to apply for a mortgage. I should ask lots of questions and put lots of lists in front of Dr. Walchin. First, if Dr. Walchin apply for a $1 million loan, the first question, what will be the maturity? I mean, how many years you will be paid back this $1 million? Let's say, Dr. Walchin saying in 20 years, meaning that each year 50,000 should be paid, right? Then let's say if the Dr. Walchin saying I need $1 million, I should ask the second and most important question. How you paid this money back? With what sources? What is your salary? What is your income? What is your wealth? I should need to check everything before start the loan and mortgage process because I should even, by the way, even I accept the loan of the mortgage and if I give the $1 million and if the Dr. Walchin buy the house, until the end of 20 years, Dr. Walchin is not the real owner of the house. I am the bank and I am the owner of the house. If Dr. Watson does not close the full amount of the loan. So even in this process, I should first be sure that how many years you will be paid back and what is your income sources? 
how you will be paid back these type of things. And in 2008, what happened? Because the Central Bank of the Federal Reserve, the United States Central Bank, decreased the interest rate in 2006 so much, there is huge liquidity in the market. And banks a little bit make their application process for the loan and mortgage flexible. So, for instance, if they have at least for 10 questions for the loan process, they skip three of them and they ask just seven of them. Then everybody try to apply to buy the mortgage and the houses. If the people like Dr. Walchin apply, it is not a problem. But if the drug user who don't have any money and any salary apply for loan and get an acceptance, this will be a huge problem for the financial market. Because one drug user is not important, but it is 5 million drug users get acceptance. This will be 5 million times the loan amount, meaning that trillion dollars. So this amount will be huge. Then in 2000, in the beginning of the 2008, some insurance firm realized that lots of loan and mortgage application accepted without checking the prerequisites. Then the money, the loan is in the United States, but those insurance and credit underwriting coming from the European and the Middle East side. So when the boom is started, first the Lehman drops and collapsed. Then the financial crisis started in the United States. Then because of the insurance firm, it contagion to the Europe, then the rest of the world. So what we are speaking about? We are speaking about if we are applying any type of credit, loan, mortgage in the banking sector. And if we are speaking about the vulnerabilities in the market, we should be really careful while making the credit application and banking sector liquidity management. So the next step in our slides will be mainly focused on how the macroprudential policy will decrease these type of systemic risk in the market because this is a systemic risk and can affect any other macro variables in the market as well. So today I will try to get a guidance to mitigate the systemic risk in the market and how we will ensure the financial services and financial stability in the market by providing a good and robust resilient support to the real economy as well. As you see here, containing the systemic risk. Systemic risk is something that you cannot be avoided. Okay, please look at this. Systemic risk can arise from severe macroeconomic shocks, financial imbalances, including excessive credit growth, leverage, and maturity mismatch, and contagion. What we mean by this? If the Russia attack to the Ukraine and if the oil prices suddenly increase in one day, this is a systemic risk. Nobody can escape from this. Dr. Walchin, whatever he do, he will not solve this problem. Otiano or Egevelka never solve this problem, whatever he do, because this is a systemic risk. You cannot avoid it. For the systemic risk, you can only minimize it. Systemic risk cannot be evaporated. Systemic risk cannot be out of the market. You can only manage and minimize the system. In order to contain this systemic risk, because we want to understand and minimize this systemic risk in the market as well. So we will try to do this. Macroprudential policy will seek now these type of priorities. Prevent the excessive build up of risk resulting from the external factors and market failures to smoothen the financial side. What we mean by this? As I said, don't forget this word. Okay, 
Don't forget this word. The JP Morgan, you know, one of the biggest investment bank in the world, and the founder, the Morgan, saying this word. And please remember this abbreviation. If you are using from the bank $1 million credit, this is your problem. But if you are using from the bank $5 billion credit, this is the bank's problem. Okay. So if the 1 million, the only problem is $1 million, this is okay. This is your problem. And it can be solved easily. But if the credit amount is $5 billion, then this is not your problem. This is the bank's problem. Banks should be really careful to not make those amount. How can I define this word? But I, I don't know what. Uh, we can say this in banking sector as uh, NPL. NPL ratio. Okay, this is NPL ratio. This is uh, non-performing loan, meaning that you have a loan, but bank cannot be collected those amount from you. Okay. And if it is one million dollar, it can be skipped up, and bank can bank solve easily this type of problem. But if it is five billion, as I say, one million credit is your problem. Five billion credit is bank's problem. Always keep this in mind. So. We have a saying in economics, too big to fail, okay? So if a credit institution is really big, even government never let them to go to collapse, okay? They will never go to bankruptcy. We will send lots of bailout package to save them because if they bankruptcy, everybody will go into bankruptcy in the market. Too big to fail, okay? They are really too big and if they collapse and go to bankruptcy everything in the market will affect even the real market factory production even the cement production even the construction even the groceries if they are really big it is not the problem of that company it is the problem of the whole system so we should prevent the excessive build up of risk what we should do we should solve the risk in each step. If the systemic risk is keeping up somewhere else and every day it is collecting in a new amount, this will be a huge risk and a build up of the risk. We should mitigate from them. The second part, make the financial sector more resilient and limit the contagion effect. What does this mean? Let's say Dr. Walsh and buy a car but he is making an insurance for that, the accident insurance, right? But the insurance company can be the European one or the Russian or Chinese. But if the 2 million people in the United States make the insurance from the Chinese firm, and if the Chinese firm collapse, what will happen to those 2 million? This will be a contagion effect, right? From China to United States. So, the macroprudential policy should also contain the contagion effect. It should also take into consideration the contagion effect from market to market. And lastly, it will encourage a system-wide perspective in financial regulation to create the right set of incentive for market participants. And we understand that this now what will be what will be our effect for those type of instrument so we understand what and we should uh, understand how to solve them and with what type of tools this should be understood so i'm saying here the instruments should be like this the regulation the banking sector regulation, macroprudential policy regulation, 
assigns the macroprudential powers to both the national authorities and the ECB from here, the European perspective. So responsibility for macroprudential policy is shaped. And macroprudential policy instrument can be distinguished along the three lines. So we should understand this point first. As you see from here, the first point, we should understand the macroprudential policies is shared between the national authorities and the higher authorities. Let's think this. Lots of us here know that each country, if they are not developed, using a bailout or support package from the World Bank or IMF, right? So if you are getting 20 billion fund from the International Monetary Fund, IMF, or the World Bank, and you are using that in the financial sector, or let's say in the agricultural sector. So you should first build up an audit, a full audit system, how those credits in the financial market, how those credit in the agricultural sector is used. This will be the regulation in national level but in the second part the imf or the world bank the higher authority in the other side international authority in the other side should also follow this type of process because they also want to know that how the credit they give should be implemented in the market decision so the responsibility in the national and international level is shared between the national authorities, like the banking regulation agency, like the central bank, like the treasury, these are in the national level. And in this side, the let's say Bank for International Settlement, BIS, or the World Bank, or the IMF, these are the international side as well. And we should take into consideration those parts for the macroprudential policy instruments as well. These are capital based measures, borrower based measures, and liquidity based measure. What we mean by this, first the amount, the capital, the loan, the credit, the first priority is this. And second priority is who is borrowing this amount. Okay, if the Dr. Walchin is applying for the credit, it is perfect, right? Because he has an ability to pay back he has an ability to close all the loans even today. And borrower side is okay. But as I say, if a drug user, if a non-income person applying and implementing those loans, the borrower is a problem. So the amount, the capital loan is first priority. The borrower who is using those loans is the second priority. And the liquidity-based measure. These are capital money and the borrower and from the banking the institution side i should also closely follow the installment and paying back period and how i will manage this liquidity if there is a problem if the credit convert into non-performing loan for instance so i should also keep these type of things in mind and now as you see here, secondly, we should take into consideration this part as well. Hang on a sec. Let me take this side to here and this side to here as well. The macroprudential policy cannot be considered an as isolation because in the beginning of the presentation, I tried to explain all participants that the macroprudential policy is the whole package with fiscal policy, with banking sector, with monetary policy. They have huge interaction between them. As here, again, iterated and mentioned again, 
cannot be considered an isolation policy. There are important interactions between microprudential, macroprudential, monetary, and fiscal policies. Let's try to check what is the interaction between the monetary policy and the macroprudential policy. As you see here, monetary and macroprudential policies interact with each other mainly via their common transmission channel. So I think the attendance is here at least understood what we mean by the interaction and transmission mechanism because we tried at least three times to explain the transmission mechanism of the monetary policy. So monetary and macroprudential policies interact with each other mainly via their common transmission mechanism. And these are through the financial system, especially through the banking system. In small countries, it is just banking. In the big countries like Germany, UK, or US, it is banking and financial institution side. And the two policy domains can complain each other in ensuring both price and financial stability. And now, macroprudential instruments can be used in a selective and targeted manner to contain financial stability risks. Even in an economic environment characterized by low inflation. So you should never think something like this. If we have a price stability and low inflation in a market, so there should be no need for macroprudential policy. This is absolutely wrong. Okay. The macroprudential policy is containing all five. For instance, you can have a stable prices and low inflation, but maybe the fiscal policy is in the wrong side. So you need again the macroprudential as well. As I say, <clears throat> the low inflation or price stability does not mean you solve all the problems in macroprudential policy. For instance, the euro area institutional setup follows and allows the European Central Bank to react the benefits of a common information set and consistent analytical framework. And let's try to look at what is the interaction with the banking sector. The microprudential supervision and the macroprudential policy supplement each other through their differing purpose. The microprudential policy increases the resilience of the individual. So as you understand from the name, it is micro. So I'm focusing on the individual. I'm focusing on the borrower. I'm focusing on the just micro in institution. But in the macroprudential perspective, I'm collecting all individual and all institution and monitoring them from a macro perspective. And this is my macroprudential policy. <clears throat> Regular meetings of the Macroprudential Policy Forum brings together the ECB Governing Council and Supervisory Board to maintain a common understanding of the situation in the financial sector. And please take a look at this chart. This is really important. I don't want to skip this chart easily because it is trying to show the all aspects of the... <clears throat> macroprudential policy and it is meaning. Please try to understand the loan laws cycle and their mitigation process. Please try to focus on what's happening here, how we can estimate and how we can interpret those type of cycles. Because this type of crap can understand and increase your <clears throat> knowledge of the financial market. And also you can easily understand what is happening here between the macroprudential measures, and the monetary policies. Let me try to explain this one. The conduct of the macroprudential policy changed through the financial cycle. What we mean by here? As you see here, this is leverage, and this is the time. What we mean by leverage? Leverage is you have a capital, you have your own capital, and in other side, we have a leverage, right? This is showing how I am using credit or loan from the market. 
the lever is showing this, or how can I say this? In the balance sheet, we have asset side and we have liabilities and owner equity side, right? In the all accountants here know that we have on the left hand side the assets, and on the right hand side, we have liabilities and owner equity. Owner equity is my own capital, and the liabilities are my credit and short-term and long-term borrowing from the market. So if I divided liability to my owner equity, this will show the leverage ratio for me. Okay, the leverage means my liability over my own capital. So if I buy a house, or let's say not about house, but a car, let's say the car is $50,000. And in my wallet, I have just 10,000. So I will apply for a credit in bank for 40,000, right? To get this car. I have 10,000. I need a borrowing. I will apply a credit from the bank for 40,000. 40,000 is my credit. And 10,000 is my own money. 40,000 over 10,000 is four. This means my leverage is four. Okay, the leverage showing how much I have borrowing, how much I owe to the market. This is the leverage ratio. And the leverage here showing, as you see, the time here. Please look at on the left-hand side, the good times, okay? When the, everything is okay, we are in the good times. The systemic risk accumulation, Leverage phase with the excess optimism, meaning that we are in a cycle, right? We are passing through a cycle. Let's say whatever I'm applying in the bank, the bank is accepting. So Ismail Adebola, Samuel Mutei, Clarence, Rubaya Yahaya, David Benjamin Ginana, all we are going to the banks, and we are applying for a borrowing and banks accepting those loans. These are good times, okay? Because banks giving credit to all applicants. They are not rejecting. This is good times. But as all David, Ismail, Samuel, Clearance, Obama, me, Dr. Walshin, when all people use this loan, because these loans are the leverage, now the bank's leverage is excessive here, right? There is a huge leverage in the banking system. There is not enough money, but everybody has a loan from the bank and they need to pay back. And let's say Samuel and Ismail saying that to the bank, I don't have enough money and this month I will not pay your credit back. This is not again a problem. But if all the participants here to do say the bank, we will not pay your money back, now this will be the bank problem because bank will not be compensate this type of huge loss. Okay, this will be a huge problem. So if the leverage is really hard, now the bank is really sensitive, sensitive to any risk of non-performing loan. So in good times, they are opening all the money and liquidity cycle. But then when the leverage reaches the peak level, then this will be a problem. Then, as you see here, the turning point, the start of the crisis, Ismail and Samuel triggered the crisis when they are saying that we will not pay the money back. Then David copied them. Then clearly say that Ismail does not pay, so I will not pay back as well. And the Samuel is saying the same. Why I'm paying this bank? Because nobody is paying. Then the crisis is starting here. Okay, because bank is in now in a crisis. He is not collecting the money back, and the deposit holder want their money, right? Because bank transferring deposit money to do Samuel and Ismail. Because they have deposit, let's say, other people put their deposit and we are using those deposit as loan. 
And if those people come to the bank and give my deposit, the bank does not have a right that I give your money to the Ismail and Samuel as credit. He should pay back. But if he shouldn't pay back because Ismail and Samuel does not bring the money back, the crisis starts. Okay? The crisis starting like in the circle. If bank, if financial institution does not manage their liquidity, their borrowing, their prerequisite good, for instance, let's say Samuel and Ismail don't have a salary, even don't have a money, and make a wrong application and paper in their documentation and make fake application and take the money. But normally Ismail and Samuel cannot get any money, even one cent from another bank because they don't have enough capability to pay back. But bank does not check this in the beginning. Then this will trigger the crisis, okay? So the financial institution has a huge responsibility to make all cross check about the client, to make necessary documentation and rules in the beginning of the application of the credit cycle, all these are the necessary process. And when the crisis started, the bad times is coming. And as you see, systemic risk materialization, deleveraging phase with the excess pessimism. Everybody will be pessimistic and they suppose that even the bank will not pay our deposit back, not the loan. The deposit, your own money will not be paid back in the cycle. In a credit cycle, the systemic risk evolved differently in two phases. The accumulation, build up, and materialization. This is the manifestation, the start of the process, the start of the crisis. Note the financial stability paradox. A system is most vulnerable when it looks most robust. This is, please read this sentence again. Note, this is the most important sentence in today's presentation, okay? Note the financial stability paradox. A system is most vulnerable when it looks most robust. What does this mean? I don't know how many people hear about the Hyman Minsky. Anybody hear about the Hyman Minsky? No. It is the father of the financial fragility and financial vulnerability literature. Okay. Hyman Minsky is the founder and the father of the financial fragility and financial vulnerability. And he is saying that financial stability brings financial instability. What does this mean? If everything is stable, bank will never ask to Ismail, does he have a salary? Because everything is good in the market. They even don't ask the question to Samuel or Ismail, do you have a capability to pay this money back? Because financially stable we are. No need to check anything. Everything is good. There is financial stability. But these type of things, bring financial instability. So Hyman Minsky saying that financial stability brings financial instability. Okay, it birth, it creates financial instability. And now, as you see here, the macroprudential policy can be defined as the application of a set of instruments. It is increase preventatively the resilience of the system in the accumulation phase against the risk of emergent, emergence of a financial instability. It can create the capital and liquidity buffers, limiting the procyclicality in the behavior of the financial system because we need some capital buffers as well to mitigate the risk. And the containing risk that individual and financial institution may create for the system as a whole as well, because Ismail, Samuel, Clarence, Rubama, David, me, if we collect each other, we will be a population and we will be a nation, okay? This will be a nation, not in the individual side. And mitigate the impacts 
in the materialization phase of previous accumulated risk of the prevention phase. I want to skip this because it is not about our boom boost cycle and credit cycle. And I want to focus on this counter cyclical capital bulk is the genuine macro prudential. If you understand the process and how the counter cyclical capital bulk all around the world working and which type of mechanism it has, you will understand truly the basic macro prudential policy instruments. As you see here, the optimists who think that we are in good times, the optimists believe that the counter cyclical capital buffers could be used for a taming a credit boom, for a taming of a credit boom, help the authorities to lean the against build up phase of the cyclical by raising the cost of credit and therefore slowing down its provision. Please try to understand this. Help the authorities to lean against the build up phase of the cycler, cycle by raising cost of credit. I'm increasing the cost of credit and therefore slowing the provision. Provision means if I have a credit, I should have a provision for them, right? If there is a possibility, Ismail not bring back the money, I should have responsibility for the deposit holders. So for the money that the Ismail used, I should have a provision here for any probability of not paying back. So if I increase the cost of credit, then my provision will back. Why? Because the people who has privilege and eligible to use the credit, not the normal and ordinary people. Only the people who is capable to pay back those money will use those credit if I increase the cost of credit, right? And this potential moderating the effect on the build up phase, the credit side should be viewed as a positive side benefit. And rather than primary aid of the counter cyclical capital bomb. And please try to check the cycle as well. This is the common reference guide from the optimist perspective again for setting the counter cyclical capital buffers is based on the aggregate private sector credit to GDP ratio. Please look at this. Why this is the most important point in the market? Why the credit to GDP ratio is really important for us? Let's say this, Ismail used the credit and Samuel used the credit, David used the credit and Dr. Walchin used the credit and we used the credit. What we will use those credit, what we will do with those credit, Ismail go to buy a lamp, Samuel buy a really luxury yacht and David buy a new really good car. Dr. Walchin apply for a really good house near the Miami, right? And if these people buy these type of asset, if Ismail, Samuel and David at the same time buy a new car, what will be the car prices? Prices of the car. It will increase, right? Because if everybody get the money from the bank and buy the same thing, the price of that thing will be increased because everybody wants to buy. So if the credit amount in the market, look at this side, this, this is the credit we used from the bank. And if the credit amount in the market is started to increase, then this will be showed us something like this. The credit is increasing and asset prices increasing. But this is not a real increase because everybody have a money from the bank. They have borrowing. Now they are starting to build up a process for what? Asset price bubbles. Asset price bubbles. 
think the Bitcoin. It was like one dollar. Now everybody is buying. It will be like an asset price bubble. Because everybody buying. There will be a bubble in the market. And it can be boom in one day. From 60,000 to 20,000 in one day. Boom. Because if there is a bubble in the asset market, we will building up a systemic risk. And this systemic risk can be really have a contagion effect in the market decision making process. And here, if the credit to GDP ratio, meaning that credit and loan amount, according to the GDP gap, if this is increasing, there will be a systemic risk problem in the market. And a gap between currently observed value and the calculated long-term trend of the private sector GDP, as you see here, here, let's look at the chart. Here I have the credit to GDP per ratio in percentage, and I have here counter-cyclical capital bulk. And until some point, I have a normal times in here, then for the 2.5% and for the 10% of the credit to GDP ratio, if this amount increasing, then I will make it smooth. And the credit to GDP ratio, if increase, my counter cyclical capital offers still the same. So for calculation of the long-term trend, the Basel committee suggests using Podrick Prescott filter with a high smoothing parameter. This is a really different and uh, private methodology in statistical and macroeconomic Sodrix Prescott filter. I'm skipping it. And the buffers set as a function of the credit to GDP ratio. And here we have some countries and their counter cyclical capital buffers and credit to GDP ratio. And as you see here on the left hand side, developments of the credit to GDP ratio in Central and Eastern European economies, Hungary, Poland, Romania, Slovenia, and the Euro area, and the development of GDP ratio in CEE countries. As you see here, these are the Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Euro area. And it is always in an upward trend. Do you see it? Upward slope. What does this mean? Today, lots of countries collecting the credit in the market and building up the risk when we compare to GDP level. If one day there will be a systemic risk like the Lehman Brothers, they will really affect severely and really in a negative side with the rest of the world in a harsh like in 2008 global financial crisis. And the credit to GDP ratio should serve only as a guard rather than relying mechanically on the credit GDP guide. Authorities are expected to apply judgment in the setting of the buffer in their jurisdiction after using the best information available. And in addition, the calculated long-term trend of the credit to GDP ratio is purely statistical measure that does not capture the turning point of the well. And therefore, Authorities should form their own judgments about the sustainable level. And lastly, as you see here, a way how to form judgment about the sustainable level of credit in the economy, because I don't want to have huge level of credit in the economy. So regressing the credit to GDP on an average economic fundamentals, like the GDP per capita, household consumption, inflation, a fixed loans to household, external funding, deposit to loan ratio, loan to value ratio, LTV is loan to value ratio, using data for developed economies. And in contrast, the Hodrick Prescott filter, the fundamental of out of sample matter takes into account the economic fundamentals, influencing the level of credit in the economy. So as you see here, 
the credit GDP ratio is around five, six percent in these economies. And as you see here now, if this amount pass over the 10 percent, this will be a huge problem for the whole financial system and will build up the mitigate the risk in the financial stability.